before the birth of Jesus Christ, the Greeks and the Romans, they had schools of music. Not only playing, playing, but even theory of music and all that. But I chose, you see, composition as my spe speciality in Vienna. And then when I was studying social anthropology, I chose as my secondary subject, social anthropology, what they call ethnomusicology. That means non-Western music. So there I had to study Chinese music, Indian music, uh, Eskimo music, and then African music also. But then for, for a specialization in uh, musical composition, I took predominantly Western music. Well, I was born, uh, first of all, in Tanzania, you know, in Tabora, you see, in the region of Tabora. Well, not in the time, you know, the name of Tabora is a name of a town also. So, uh, but I'm not from the town, but in the neighborhood of the town. So I was born in 1931. Yes, the 9th of December. And I was in a, I born in a capital family both my mother and, and my father, they were Catholics. I was born, in, first of all, in a, in a place in a, which is called Ndala. Yeah, it was a kind of uh, chiefdom at that time. You see, the chiefdom of Ndala. There were many, many chiefdoms among the Wanyamwezi, you see. You know, Ayeme Mnyamwezi by tribe, which is the same, in fact, as the Wasukuma. So now, after my birth, I did primary school in Ndala. You know, at that time, the primary school, you know, it was only for four years. And then later on, then I went to, first of all, to St. Mary's, which was a Catholic uh, secondary school, in fact. And later on, I joined Itaga, Itaga Seminary, minor seminary which is a minor seminary of the archdiocese, Tabor, it is still existing. And then at the beginning of 1955, I joined the major seminary of Kipalapala. And there I stayed, I think, for about eight years. And then in 1962, I was ordained as a diocesan priest of the archdiocese of Tabora. In 1963 then, in February, I was sent to Europe for studies, higher studies in the university. So I was first of all sent to Belgium in the Catholic University, uh, which still exists, you see, which is called Louvain in French. They call it Leuven, eh? yeah. So there I studied dogmatic theology, and uh, but also, I joined the conservatorium uh, where I studied especially pianoforte and musical theory. So I stayed in Louvain for six years because I went to Louvain in 1963, uh, so some months after my priestly ordination. And then I stayed there till 1969. Then I went to Vienna, which is the capital of Austria. And in fact, the main, the main goal, according to my bishop, was that I should study music there. Then I also studied social anthropology. Hmm? Social anthropology, because I had discovered in Louvain that in fact, for what we call today African theology of enculturation, you won't be able to do it really as it should be done if you don't know much about African 
traditional customs, African culture, you see. And that is why, in fact, when I was in Louvain, first of all, for my MA thesis, I chose the works of Mircea Eliade. Do you know him? Because, you know, Mircea Eliade is a philosopher, but he's also, and perhaps even more, more known for, for that, he's also a, a scientist of religions, what they call comparative study of religions. Eh? That means, you know, he's, he's not a theologian, no. That is a, a, a special kind of study. They study all religions, Christianity included, in order to know what religion is, you see. So I, I chose my, him for my MA teachers in Louvain. The title was Christian and Non-Christian Initiation in the Works of Messiah Eliade. That was my MA thesis. And you know, in studying his works in Louvain, I started now also studying the African religions. Yes. Because he writes, uh, you see, as a, a scientist of religions, he writes on all religions, African religions included. So then I chose that, you see, initiation uh, uh, rituals, and then it opened my eyes really to, Af to the richness of African traditional culture. Yes. Of course. Uh, with special reference to African religions. For my doctoral dissertation in Louvain, first of all, I wanted to take the works of Messiah Eliade on initiation. My uh, mentor in dogmatic theology, this is what he had suggested. He said, now for your MWA, you have studied the works of Messiah Eliade on initiation. But you have not studied him as a theologian because he's, he's not a theologian, he's a scientist of religions. But now, try now to take now Christian initiation now and then try to compare with the works of Messiah Eliade on initiation. You take Christian initiation and also non-Christian. But according to me, say Eliad, I chose the three initiation rituals, Christian initiation rituals. That means baptism, confirmation, and Eucharist. You know how we're initiated in the church. Then I tried to see whether from those three initiation rituals, what we call today enculturation of the liturgy of Christian initiation ritual could be made. My bishop wanted me to study music only in Vienna. But then I asked him, because I had discovered the importance of social anthropology in what we call today enculturation. And in fact, I had even an idea of African theology, you see already during my last years in the major seminary. Because at that time, the missionaries in the major seminary, they started said, now you Africans now, you need to have your um, own African theology, your own African literature, your own African philosophy. You know the year of when the symposium in Europe of the African priests met in, in France mm -hmm. to discuss what we call today uh, African theology. And that kind of meeting was called the Prêtre Noir Tanteroge because they had discussions, they were published in a book which was called the Prêtre Noir Tanteroge. And in fact, historically, uh, you see, that event which took place in 1956, you see, yes, is considered as the year when a real awareness of the need of African theology started. 
and that compound uh, uh, symposium effect had an effect because you see they wrote that and even in Africa in other parts of Africa it was heard and missionaries already started speaking about the possibility of having an African theology an African philosophy and so on I think the Church of Africa today needs that African scientific theology. Hmm? So now, this question which you posed, eh? now, is there a possibility of African theology? Eh, because you saw science is science. Eh? You have, for instance, eh, mathematics. Is it possible to speak of African mathematics or so on? No, it's possible. No. Many Westerners say, because you can see that <clears throat> I want to construct a scientific African theology. You see, that means using critical reason and so on, using even metaphysics, which is, you know, very critical and so on, and even the metaphysical concepts of, for instance, I'm speaking about ancestorship and so on and so on. So some are saying now this is Western. Huh? Yeah. You know, some of them they say the African language is symbolic. You know, when we say ancestorship, you are on the level of the these pure concepts, eh? abstraction, eh? and then you remain with what is essential and so on. Whereas a symbol is not abstractive, no? It's that with something concrete, historically, and then he try to analyze it like that. You see, so that is more African than this conceptual way of thinking and so on, and critical. And even some said, even, <coughs> you see, the Africans, you see, they don't know the principle of non-contradiction. <laughs> you know, really, nearly unbelievable, Vehekangas, who was the first man to write his doctoral dissertation on my writings. You see, you know, Vekanga is, is, is still young. Eh? I think now he should be in his 40s. Eh? He should be in his 40s. But in his doctoral dissertation, he there in that thing, he says, first of all, Father Nyamisi says, when he's doing theology, he should use the principle of non-contradiction. He said, but recent studies have been made by a, Euro a European among the Wanyamwezi. And that European has said the Wanyamwezi have no idea of the principle of non-contradiction. <laughs> I've been thinking about these questions since I was in the seminary, I told you. But now I've come to a firm conviction that, no, what I'm doing now is the right thing. My major directive in African theology is the encyclical Fides Ratio of John Paul II. Do you know that? Yes. You know he was a philosopher and a well-known philosopher. There are people who have written doctoral dissertations on Wojtyla. Eh? Yes. Oh, yes. So he knew. And you could see his encyclicals. They are so rich and, and even theologically he was a great theologian also. But philosopher also, eh? you see, and you know that encyclical now confirmed me that really what I, the way I'm following is quite correct. Eh? You see, <clears throat> uh, so I want in fact an African theology which is scientific. I found Chibangu also yeah. when I went to Louvain. But at that time, he was preparing for his, what they call, the postdoctoral dissertation. And I was there at his defense in Louvain. We didn't stay in the same house, but I found him. With Chamalenga, yes. Chamalenga was doing his doctoral dissertation in theology. I started discussing with him these questions. In fact, I want to know how to do African theology and so on. He told me that has been my question since I was in the major seminary. And this is what, yes, Chamalenga, he told me. 
And then I told him, I said, <clears throat> because at that time I was thinking that, first of all, I must examine that philosophy, especially from the language of the Africans. Eh? Uh, and even when I met Professor uh, Bandrit to ask him about how to do African philosophy, I started giving him some examples. For instance, if you take our language eh, and you compare them to European language, eh, a European would say, for instance, I understand something. Eh? Eh? And you use the language, for instance, in French, je comprends, and in French, you say, in English, I understand, and so on. But we, in Africa, for, among my people, we say, I have heard you. So then for me, then, that was a, a philosophical problem. For the whites, they say, I have understood. We say, I have heard. So I think this is, Poses some philosophic questions there, and so on and so. Chamalenga, one of the things which influenced, he said, "No, that is not a question on African theology. Not very well put. For me, I should start with studying culture first of all, the African cultures, eh? and there is in that culture what we call African philosophy, in fact." So there, there, he started. I changed really, what is it? I got that kind of influence. But Chibangu, first of all, as I told you, I stayed with him, I think, only for one year because I found him finishing and I attended his thesis and I bought also his, his matrix thesis, which I read. Eh? That means it was on the question between. Uh, speculative and non-speculative theology, how to solve the problem and so on. Uh, and uh, he spoke also about African theology, but only as prolegomena. That means, you see, it's something which you have to do, and there is the possibility, and so on. But how to do it? No, he didn't influence me much, no. But Chamalenga, yes, especially the idea of culture. I am not alone, yeah. but in fact, even Chamalenga is attacked. Eh? attacked yeah. You see, Bujo is attacked, Mbiti is attacked, mm -hmm. and all the others. They say, these so called African theologians, many of them studied in Europe or America. They have been westernized, and now they are speaking about African theology. The way how they are doing it, in fact, is Western African theology, or, the, or they are, although they are using some categories which are African like ancestor and uh, initiation and so on, but the way of doing theology is Western simply because they are using the critical method and so on, they are using abstract concepts and so on, that is what uh, they say. But for me, no, 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 I say no, even an African theology which is conceptual can be authentically African. I want you to see the metaphysical and critical way of thinking, I introduce it in the African theology and also in the African metaphysics, which I want to develop. For instance, what they suggest, for instance, like in African Christology, and that is true. They say the African were teaching their philosophy and even their religions using stories, for instance, and in those stories, they were using symbols, you see, and that's quite true. Because I know when I was still young, in the evening we used to gather around a fire. Mm -hmm. And then there were old people and sometimes even young people who were telling stories. Some of those stories, you see, they were only for amusement, recreation. But some of them, really, they were teaching us, even you could say philosophical elements. And they said, this method, in fact, 
was even used by Christ himself, eh? you see, in teaching. Eh? For instance, an example was given to me by people like Behekanga. There are different ways of showing that God is uh, very merciful. You can start by saying, first of all, I start from the notion of mercy. Mercy is a pure perfection. Because you can analyze it and then because even in God, it, it exists as a pure perfection and is identical with his own being and so on and so on. And then I must say then, since God is absolutely perfect being, a mercy is found in him and it is even identified with himself. So God is in fact a mercy itself. Now that's metaphysical. They said Jesus used another a uh, way to show us that God is very merciful. Like the Africans, he started with a story. Once upon a time, there was a man who had two sons. Now the younger one told him, his father, no, if you're no father, you will soon die. It's better that, you see, I know my brother, you see, it's better that you distribute your belongings to us before you die. Oh, the father you gave him, you know, the story of the prodigal son and how he was drifted. So they say now here Jesus was also trying to show how good is infinitely perfect by using a story. So this is how African should be done. But now Father Yamiti is doing it now, taking this for this ancestorship and so on and so on and so on. So this is the question now we just put. We are moving to what they call globalization. We are moving to a kind of general word, a common uh, culture, you see. And that is why, you see, African theologians should now try to build a theology which is really universal rather than local. I say hey, this is completely wrong. Yeah. And moreover, I have here now, you see, Vatican II, which really supports me. Because it's Vatican II now, and you know, for us Catholics, you see, the voice of an ecumenical council is the voice of the Holy Spirit himself. Now, it has prescribed as a necessity African theology. Yes. That now, we should have one faith, one kind of morality, but now that should be lived according to the different uh, cultures of the people and so on. That's Vatican II. Eh? So I think that is a necessity and that's what I'm doing. My um, method is a method on African Christian theology uh, dealing with African systematic theology on the dogmatic level. Eh? You know there are different departments in, 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 in theology. You have biblical studies, uh, biblical theology, you have uh, canon law, although some said it's not theology, but I'm, I'm, I'm convinced it's also theology. You have moral theology, you have liturgy, you have, anyway, and you have still others. Right? But my special area is dogmatic theology. Yeah? And there are, in fact, different methods of doing African theo uh, dogmatic theology. And, uh, you know, in his, one of his books, this every dialect, he said, before Vatican II, in the Catholic Church, we had one uniform method of doing theology. Eh? But now he says there is no uniform method of doing theology, systematic theology. There are many. He gives more than 10, you see. So mine, you see, is only one of those theologies. And according to every dialect, he said those ways, other ways of doing theology, in fact, they are not condemned by the Catholic Church, no. 
they are welcome. But provided they keep within some basic principles of African, of Catholic theology, eh? you see, they must, uh, there are some methods which has been, have been repudiated by the church in the course of history and even today. Eh? So you cannot say that my method which I'm using, although also it is the method which the church ac accepts is the only one, no. But in fact, I have used uh, the method which was used since when the Catholic Church went to the pagans, you see, of the time, uh, the beginning of Christianity in the first century, first and second century and so on. And there then they met the different philosophies. Eh? And the philosophy, among the philosophies which uh, the Catholic uh, Church used for theological uh, purposes was the Greek philosophy. Uh, and you know, Greek philosophy was not single. Eh? You had Platonism, you, have, uh, you, you, you could explain even better. Aristotelianism was one of them. You had Stoicism and so on and so on. So, the church took this, and even the fathers of the church, they used this method. Eh? But, after some time, in fact, especially in the Catholic Church, one method prevailed, you could say, and even the magisterial doctrine was stressing some elements of that method, which, in fact, said should be characterize every uh, uh, systematic theology in the Catholic Church. Yeah? And you could say this was the method which was used in the Middle Ages by St. Thomas Aquinas. And he was not alone, yeah? you see, because he got, he got this uh, method uh, from his teacher, eh? Albert the, the Great. Eh? You see, but uh, St. Thomas, of course, he, he amplified it and he went even beyond him. There were also other methods in, in the Middle Ages. Eh? You see, for instance, the method of St. Bonaventure. You know, that was the Augustinian eh, kind of theology, which the church has never condemned, no. But if you take even the documents of the church at that time, and even later on, they preferred the method which used Aristotelian philosophy. Eh? Aristotelian philosophy. So my method now, I could, I, I cannot say that it is only that. No, because I try now to use some of the principles, fundamental principles, which were proposed even officially by the church. They said in Catholic systematic dogmatic theology, uh, these methods, for instance, let me be sp specific now. It speaks of the three traditional theological techniques. So, I have tried now to use, for instance, this non initiation, a pubertal initiation ritual now, as a point of departure for reflecting on the mystery of what the church is, eh? you see, or who Christ is, or what the sacraments are, and so on and so on. And then I have used this idea of uh, the conception of life. And that is why in one of the dissertations which were made in Europe about my writings, of course it was written in the 1990s. Eh? So this was uh, in full James, do you know him? You see, he studied three 
no, five, in fact, theologians, eh? you see, on creation, God and creation. Three African theologians, I was one among them, but he took also Kwesi uh, Dixon from Ghana and John Pobe. And then he himself, he was an Anglican, and then he took two European theologians, Karl Barth and Pannenberg, on what they say about the theology on God and creation. And what about these three African theologians say about the same issue? Eh? And he, he tries to see how they could mutually enrich each other. It's very interesting. He said now the method of Charles Nyamiti, he said, is vitalistic. So then, you know the word vitalistic, it takes it from the Latin uh, word vita, which means life. Yes, that is true. I have reflected on that. But the thought pattern on which I have reflected particularly is that one, but also on African uh, conception of person, especially as it is understood when person is taken in the sense of fullness of humanity, which is achieved through initiation, uh, ritual initiation processes at, at the, the age of puberty. Because that is also one of the subjects which I studied, not only in, in theology, but also social anthropology, you see. So I combined it, vitalism and personalism. Others have said you would, instead of saying person, you should say Ubuntu. So these are some of the chief um, thought patterns I've used. So ancestor, African traditional understanding of ancestor, and then initiation, in which then this idea of vitalism also is closely connected. I have also taken the African understanding of name. I developed it especially in two essays, which are found in African Christian studies on the African understanding of name, you see. So I intend, if God gives me the time and also the health, now to, I have already applied it in explaining the Trinity and also Christology, yeah. Although I said now, my articles there were not complete, they are, they are still to be continued. So I'm intending to, to publish this one. So those are the main categories I'm, I've used so far. But now in using all these categories, I try to insert them in the magisterial teaching about the use of the three traditional techniques, you see. That means you have to use the principle of analogy of being, this first principle, and uh, then the principle of in the interconnection of the mysteries, divine mysteries, and also you have to indicate the spiritual and material relevance of any theological topics you are dealing with. Eh? So you see, these are the, called the three traditional theological techniques, uh, which you, you find in Catholic books. So I am using this. And that is why then I say, could you say my method is uh, Thomistic? I would say yes and no. If you say it's Thomistic, it's just identified with the way of doing theology as St. Thomas did and so on, I would say no. 
But in saying that, there are many similarities between what I'm doing and what St. Thomas did, and that I quite agree. Now, very concretely, I have a, a concrete examples I have shown eh? in the first uh, volume. There, I explicate the mystery of Jesus Christ. I start, rather, to explicate that. But then I said, in order to understand the Catholic understanding of who Christ is, you have to start, first of all, from the Trinity. Eh? Because, and even if you, you take the Bible, in fact, it presents Christ. In fact, you cannot understand him fully uh, without taking the biblical teaching, which teaches that, in fact, Christ is the second, is the Son of God, born from all eternity, who became man in order to redeem us in the Holy Spirit. Christ is the Son of the Father, Um, and the two live their relationship in the Holy Spirit. Eh? You see, because it is a, a mystery of love. Eh? Uh, the Father loves the Son and the Son loves the Father. And by loving in this way, they spire the Holy Spirit. And then by after spirating Him logically, they communicate him to each other in token of, that means, as expression of their mutual uh, love to each other. Myself, then I say in African terms, not only because of love, but also because of homage and respect towards uh, the sanctity of, the mutual sanctity of one another. And that is why then I, I say the the Father in the Trinity, now ancestrally speaking, the Father is the ancestor of the Son, and the Son is the descendant of the Father, and the Holy Spirit is the ritual offering, the ritual offer between Father and Son.